Okay. So hi everybody, welcome to uh, planning for almost series 115, code name Peacock. Um, we will um, just the meeting logistics. Please mute your line. Uh, the call is being recorded. And also, just a quick note: we already uh, this is an afternoon session. Uh, we already held a morning session, and uh, since we don't have uh, that many more attendees, what we're going to do is run through the meeting through the first part of the meeting, which will be a repeat from the morning session in an accelerated form. And primarily leave um, a room for the new content, which was, which is the GUI um, uh, the slides that were added uh, since the morning, and also the new GUI demo, and also a demo of uh, the inbound telemetry. Okay, so with that, uh, um, let's um, let's uh, take a look at the goals for this meeting, which is to review and uh, and demonstrate some of the already accomplishments. Also, uh, review and propose the various Peacock uh, release deliverables. And this is to, in order to help people with shared interests connect and help each other work on various uh, parts of the uh, platform. And also to uh, plan for any dependencies or collisions that we might have uh, due to the proposed work. Okay, so Peacock schedule um, it's a four month uh, release, so we will be releasing Peacock in the middle of December, not too close to the holidays. Um, we are allowing two week window for feature uh, freeze and to achieve stability. And unlike with our release, we pre scheduled two milestones uh, for the various parts of the uh, project to present their progress as we're uh, moving through the release. And these uh, dates have been added to the OMAS calendar. And uh, so please, please uh, keep an eye on them. The major uh, release uh, objectives are uh, basically platform upgrade, and we'll go through more details on that later. Uh, initial code base disaggregation uh, to be able to slim down the, uh, the overall size of the source code base and to move some of the peripheral components into their own repos, and also to enable semantic versioning uh, and uh, separate versioning of the different pieces. Also, we want to eliminate the incubator area. Uh, so the code in, currently in incubator will either move out to their separate uh, repositories as extensions, or it'll move to core. Also, we want to accomplish better UPAN alignment, uh, other than just mental alignment, actually do something and, and in you know, concrete form. And uh, stretch goal is to uh, review the gRPC APIs for the project to facilitate process disaggregation down the line. All right, with that, uh, we can start moving to core platform. Um, do you guys want to take care of that? Uh, do you want to just really quickly mention that? Uh, sure. Some pieces here. So um, we kind of got stuck on this train that was running off the tracks with Buck. Um, we made a bunch of custom edits to the Buck code, which turned out to be much harder to maintain than we thought. We got several releases behind on Buck, and then we came to realize that Buck is really not being maintained to the level we wanted it to. So we decided to look around and try out something called Bazel, which is a, a Google tool supported by a pretty large um, open source community, uh, documented pretty well, runs pretty well. So Thomas and I did the work to uh, port most of Onos from Buck to Basil, and then Carmelo and others got some of the pieces that we didn't get. So the bottom line is we now are building 114 and beyond with Basil. Uh, the plan for 115, which has already been checked in this morning, is to remove all the POM files so we will no longer be able to build Onos with Maven. We have to leave a few POM files in there for archetypes and for basically deploying as artifacts to Maven Central, but we won't actually use them for our own builds at all. We intend to also deprecate Buck, maybe even remove Buck in 115 if we can uh, get some static analysis tools that we are currently using working under Bazel. We didn't have time to get them working under Buck. Um, and that's basically the story about Bazel. Okay. Jordan, you want to cover the Atomix and ISSU? Yeah, so for basically distributed systems in Ono, so what we did is move the distributed primitives into a separate project, which is Atomics. 
Uh, with the benefit of that being that more people can use them, more people can test them, we get more contributors because more applied more broadly than this to uh, SDN. Uh, similarly, uh, cluster management has moved into atomics and uh, intro cluster communication is in atomics. So, uh, yeah, so all that stuff is now maintained there. So what this does is separates uh, essentially a lot of the a lot of the management of distributed protocols into into atomics. And so that's huge for ISSU because that uh, part of that work is supporting rolling upgrades in atomics, which means we can uh, users can now introduce uh, bug fixes and new features for new distributed systems features into their ONOS cluster. Uh, without any downtime, and the next uh, portion of that is doing the same for the OS controller. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Let's take a look at the uh, um, debug deliverables. Do you want to go over that a little bit, uh, Ray, just briefly? So, uh, we've gotten kind of behind on some core technologies, and we want to take uh, a bit of a breather in 115 and allow us to upgrade. Um, Basically, these three things that are, these things that are listed here, Carafe and Jetty, are kind of one bundle. Uh, Java 10 and then Bazel, they're all kind of related. Uh, Bazel 116 comes with Java 10 by default, and our current version of the uh, of one of the containers within Carafe does not work with Java 10. So that's kind of what's driving all these upgrades. In addition to, there's a bunch of security and optimization changes that have been made. So uh, kind of early on in the release, we want to try to upgrade this, the infrastructure so that we are um, more on track with some of the open source tools that we can use. And also this will bring us, uh, allow us to work with OpenJDK. Yes, that's right. All right, so on our core. Yeah, so since we moved uh, primitives into atomics, the plan is to ultimately uh, deprecate some of the distributed system APIs, the low-level APIs that are currently in OS. And then uh, what we've been seeing more and more is people deploying ONOS on Kubernetes, and so there's going to be a lot of work uh, in the Peacock release towards uh, sort of a standardized implementation of Kubernetes around the Kubernetes setup, uh, solving a lot of the problems that come along with that so we can uh, answer a lot more questions that are thrown at us about container orchestration. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go really quickly through the yeah. before stuff. So regarding P4 for the ALB release, the accomplishments were, uh, uh, were possible thanks to contributions of many uh, brilliant members. So thank you all. Uh, in terms of uh, accomplishments, first of all, we, we now have an uh, NANOS a new service. Uh, to manage at the network level uh, in man network telemetry, so called INT, uh, when using uh, P4 devices. We also provide uh, a reference uh, implementation of INT called INT.P4, and this was demonstrated at the 50 P4 workshop in Stanford. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I forgot to share screen. Yeah. I guess it is. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, and, and we'll see a demo later uh, from John One. We had a new features to Fabric.p4, including uh, VLAN tag ports, uh, support for app request broadcast, IPv4 multicast, and clone to control the behavior, and also initial INT uh, support. We have a new repository uh, called Fabric P4 Test, where we have a number of test cases. Uh, for uh, data plane tasks based on PTF for Fabric.p4. This is apparently not part of Honest, but it's a supporting the work of Fabric.p4. And test cases now cover uh, basic forwarding capabilities, GTP termination, and INT. We have a new STC scenario to deploy Fabric.p4 and test that. We have a number of P4 and improvements to the P4 and time southbound, mainly uh, improvements to uh, scalability. We're now able to test large networks of around 200 BMV2 instances on three node on this cluster and maybe more. Uh, we support reconnection to lost devices and we also support uh, P4 and time uh, multicast APIs. Uh, there's a new P4 and time based driver for uh, devices based on the Mellanox Spectrum uh, ASIC. 
And we also improved the learning material with the new Honors of P uh, Plus P4 tutorial that includes uh, uh, new hands-on exercises and a new sample application called uh, MyTunnel. And that's it for the accomplishments. Okay, thank you. In terms of uh, deliverables, uh, we plan to continue work on improving P4 and time, and this is really towards compliance with the upcoming uh, version 1.0 of the specification. And the way we will test that is by testing interoperability with Stratum. So, so far we've been testing only one implementation of a P4 and time switch agent, which is called PI, and now it's time to, uh, uh, to test um, how that works with other implementation like Stratum and hopefully uh, that will be entirely compliant with uh, uh, version of one of the, of the specification. We're planning on working on um, adding support for GNMI and GNOI. We don't have specific models at, the, at this time, but the work will be mainly driven by the, what's available in the Stratum implementation. Most probably we will start with port uh, get, set, subscribe, uh, but other models, we will see what, what comes first in, in Stratum. And we also plan to do more fabric before improvements, including interoperability with OpenFlow switches, support for double billing tags, pipeline optimization, improving support for INT, and, uh, and perhaps more features opportunity based on uh, demos and uh, that we plan uh, during the next four months. The first milestone is to present a demo of Charlie's working with both P4 and OpenFlow switches, so to, to show the interoperability. Uh, between the two, and the second one is about uh, demonstrating support for GNMI and GNOI in ours. That's it. Excellent. Thank you. You want to go over this really quickly? Yes, uh, you want? Your, your line. Oh, your line? Okay. Your line. Yeah, I'm online. So uh, I can cover this. Uh, for QA, uh, we mainly focus on Charles testing and HA testing. And for Charles, uh, so the, the Charles team helped us to uh, keep all the plan tests, which include the complex scenarios for Malikas and routing feature. And we also covered router failure scenarios and hosting scenarios. And then we started work on to migrate the existing system routing tests to the hardware pod. Uh, for HA, we uh, finished the power failure test. And we also migrated all the HA tests to Use the segment routing setup. Um, besides these two items, we also updated test log framework to and, and the test to accommodate Atomic 3.0 upgrade. And then uh, we also include the documentation for Gentex and R uh, For deliverables, okay. So still focusing on the segment routing and HA. So we will be. Um, migrating all our second running tests to the hardware, and we will uh, also implement the wild test. Um, for HA, since so the separation of atomic and on introduced a lot of new scenarios, so we will test plan for other scenarios, and then we start to work uh, to create or update the HA test, and uh, we will also create more upgrade. And then after we get the, the feature of running uh, uh, Kubernetes, we will also um, test that. Um, for the milestones, we are planning to demonstrate how we run the same set of camera routing tests on both mininet and the uh, hardware part. Uh, the other milestones are basically just the creation of QA deliverables. That's it. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, Sean was kind enough to provide um, um, a summary of his accomplishments for the GUI 2 rework. Um, he was unable to attend. He said he would try, but apparently he didn't, uh, wasn't able to make it. But anyway, thank you, Sean, anyway, for uh, putting this together. So I'm going to try to do best uh, trying to um, represent the work. So the, the purpose here is basically to upgrade uh, the, um, um, the GUI framework to use the latest, or I guess more modern versions of Angular, because the versions of Angular that current UI uses is getting obsolete. 
And so we're basically moving on to v6, which is a huge upgrade from version 1.3, which is going to be obsolete in about three, two years. Um, it's also built uh, using CLI, supports test and minting. Um, currently, it's uh, working under Buck. This is one piece of the code that was not moved to Bazel yet, but that will be done very, very shortly. Uh, but since this is not part of the official build anyway, it doesn't really matter. So the framework code has been mostly uh, ported to Angular 6. Uh, there still remains to be some refactoring done to be able to align to better with Angular 6 philosophy, like for example, no, um, no uh, direct element manipulations, which is something what the, uh, the P3 framework does specifically, and relies on it specifically for implementing the topology view. Also, the localization, the web sockets, the menu, navigation, and uh, majority of the tabular uh, views have all been ported. So uh, that's actually quite impressive. Um, the table builder has been replaced with, uh, um, with just basically base classes, just using object-oriented uh, type um, um, principles, which are now possible with uh, ES6. Uh, some of the enhancements made along the way uh, was to enable lazy loading. So, for example, only the parts of the UI that are necessary are, uh, are loaded. Uh, so the views load on demand, which is nice and helps with performance and crispier operation of the UI. Um, the good news here is that this all required very little changes to the back-end Java code. Most of this is to do with modifying the front-end code. So this is this is really nice, um, and uh, the the work that remains uh, for Peacock uh, is to upgrade uh, the GUI two to be built with Bazel. Um, most likely, it's going to use generals to begin with, and then later on, it will start exploring some of the work in progress, uh, Angular uh, and Node uh, JS related uh, rules for Bazel. I think they're in a similar shape where the protobufs are, in the sense that some of the rules are sort of working, but not really. So I think the general will be kind of an escape hatch that we can use to get some of the things done and get working, and then later on make it more elegant. Um, also, uh, what remains to be done is support for building um, the UI extensions in external applications, such as, for example, Yang UI or other the Path Painter and other things like that. Um, also, the, the merge of the topology view and topology 2 view um, into one topology view. Currently, the topo 2 and topology view are available along the side, but uh, the, the topo 2 view upgrade has stagnated a little bit, so we're trying to use this effort to merge the two views together and move it along. Also, documentation has to be done uh, to, um, to basically document how extensions uh, can be developed and uh, also how the GUI tube can be maintained. And of course, more client side unit tests will be also helpful. So, the milestone one will be used to demonstrate the basal build of the GUI tube and then uh, the external GUI applications. And then the topology view um, will be merged uh, to Angular 6 as part of the second milestone. And so we're definitely looking for people with, uh, with uh, knowledge of Angular 6 and uh, the overall behavior of the topology view to help with that migrating effort, because uh, Sean is most likely not going to be able to dedicate uh, enough time to be able to tackle that. So we're looking for volunteers from the community to help in this area. And clearly, expertise in Basel will also work in assisting the uh, Basel-based build of the UI. So that's that. I think we are uh, ready to move to the um, uh, owl release demos. And the afternoon ones are John Wan. John Wan, do you want to go first? Do you have a recording, or um, how do you want to do this? Should I share screen with you and then you drive the demo, or do you want me to? Um, point the um, YouTube video and play it from, from here. How do you want to do that? Uh, okay, so I have uh, prepared one slide, and then I will play the, the demo video. 
Okay, so I'm going to give you the presentation rights. Okay. When you're ready, please share your um, share your screen. <clears throat> All right, I can see it. Okay, thank you. So, uh, what I did is uh, implementing the IN. T support to the owners called IT service. So for those who are not familiar with the INT, I will briefly explain first about what INT is. So INT stands for the Inbound Network Telemetry, which is the network monitoring framework for collecting and reporting the network state. And this network state includes, for example, switch ID, hop latency, and Q occupancy, QID, and so on. And it's done by the data play. So as you can see in the bottom right side of the figure, uh, the, this figure shows how it works very, very briefly. So the ID data is injected inside to the normal data packet. So at first, at the first stop of the switch, it's called the INT source. And uh, here, the flow rule, <coughs> uh, uh, the INT header and corresponding metadata are injected and, and then following the normal forwarding path. And uh, at each hop, uh, switch can add the INT metadata according to the INT header. And at the last top of the switch called INT sync, uh, restore the original packet and forward it to the destination and then it can uh, it then forward the collected int metadata to the external int collector so this is very basic of the int and the role of the onus especially for the onus int service is managing these uh, managing this process uh, to be specific, installing and removing the flow rules to inject the IAT header and they collect the IAT metadata. And so the auto IAT service is the service to control the IAT capable devices. And then we also define a network level API to orchestrate the generation and the collection process of these telemetry data. And for the device, driver side, we also expose the IT program, programmable, which can be used for both people capable and also non people capable devices to share the common uh, interface to implement their own driver. So uh, for now, I will play the video to, oh, sorry. So I will play the demo video and explain how it works. So can you see my the yep. video now? Yep. Okay, so let me start. Here we will start with this very basic topology, two by two topology with, and <clears throat> two hosts are attached to the each lip switch. And this topology is built with the Mininet and BMV2 software switch. And the very first thing to do is enable the IT service in the on a GUI. And it will add another GUI page to manage the, the IT related <laughs> configuration. So first thing to do is configuring the INT report collector. So since it's running outside of the ONOS, uh, we need to configure uh, the INT collector also on the outside of the ONOS. And then uh, we will generate a sample flow we are targeting to monitor. So I've done this using the Mininet and iperf. After that, uh, uh, we are 
specify the five tuple flow rules to specify the target to monitor. Uh, here we are calling it as an int intent. Uh, but uh, one thing I want to notice here is that uh, I, we just borrow the name of the intent from the honest intent framework, but we are not using the int intent framework at this moment. We are just using the name and concept of the intent. So here, specifying the source address and destination address and port and the protocol. So we can specify all of this field or uh, can skip uh, some of the fields and it's also widely carded. And then specifying the type of the metadata to monitor. So here we specify the switch ID, hop latency and egress timestamp to collect. And then by clicking the deploy, the intents are deployed and metadata is set. Uh, these three metadata are set. And then this is the collector GUI, uh, which we are using uh, Grafana as a GUI. And you can see that the uh, metadata is being collected for each hop of the switch and also the flow latency. And what does the honest INT service did is decomposing this intent into several flow rules. So I will show you uh, how this uh, INT service installs the INT related flow rules into the switches. So first thing is the first top switch, which we call as the source switch. So this, these are the INT related flow rules. Uh, so these rules are installed by the INT service and this rule specified the target flows to monitors and you can see that the many packets are being matched by this rule. So this rule will add the INT header to each of the packets to matching this rule. And then there are several rules to process the INT metadata, to adding the INT metadata to each of the packet. And at the transit switch, it just parses the INT header and then it will, this is the very basic uh, forwarding rules uh, installed by the intent framework. And this rule will add uh, its own metadata to each of the packet. And then last, uh, the last hub of the switch, also the basic, <coughs> uh, so this rule will add the metadata also And also uh, has the very basic forwarding rule to the destination. And then this rule will forward the collected IT metadata to the external collector. Also, uh, here we assume that this collector is attached to the this last of switch. Maybe I want to clarify something quickly. So what's happening uh, in this last switch is that basically we've been collecting this INT metadata all over the path. Mm -hmm. And the last switch what it's doing is actually generating a new packet. So it's forwarding the original packet as it was. Mm -hmm. a, new one a new one with IP address and MAC address that's actually derived from the uh, host that owns this core and sending that to the collector. I see. Yeah. From, from the yeah. Level, Thank you. Program the what we want to monitor and the, and the IDs. Sorry, John, one for interrupting you. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Nice. 
going back. Sorry. So going back to the GUI, so we can also remove the, uh, the intent. So by removing the intent, that we can see that uh, the data is not collected anymore on the GUI side. And also floor rules are removed from the switch. Nice. Well, rules are gone. Okay, this is the end of the demonstration. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Okay. You're welcome. And so now it's uh, time for uh, Sean's demo, which is also a recording. So what I'm going to do is steal the presentation rights. Okay. Do you think the audio will work? What? Do you think, uh, I'll find out. If it doesn't, then I'll just leave it. I'll have to modify it anyway, the presentation, so to, because I didn't, wasn't sharing my screen. Oh, I did again. Yeah. So I will actually add the slides to okay. the audio. So with that, we can uh, hear his, uh, um, about 10 minutes uh, demonstration just going over. Um, Sean, going over what he did. Okay, this is a short video about the uh, Onus GUI 2 work that's going on in the Onus project. Um, so there's uh, a set of slides uh, here that uh, explain some of the rationale uh, from going from the old GUI to the, the new one. Uh, and really the reason is to be able to avail of uh, the Angular 6 framework. Angular 1 uh, which is what the old GUI is built on, built on is now obsolete and uh, and uh, you might see that referred to as AngularJS. Um, so the new Angular framework, which is at version 6, is just called Angular, so you find the documentation on it at angular.io. So some of the reasons uh, for going with uh, Angular 6 are, well, it's a modern uh, sort of well-kept and maintained uh, framework uh, for for uh, running applications and building applications with and there's a lot of tooling uh, that comes with it that wasn't there in the days of angular js so uh, in honest we decided we try to take advantage of these for any new applications we want to build them on top of uh, angular 6 so uh, i'll give the link to this uh, slide set at the end uh, of the presentation um, but really, uh, let's uh, just have a look at uh, what's involved in um, uh, upgrading to Angular 6. So a lot of the uh, existing um, code uh, for running the, or the Onus GUI uh, is uh, very complex and, uh, and uh, really it does a, a tremendously complex job. It's amazing what was done with uh, the original version of the GUI. Um, so I think uh, the objective was to mimic uh, the old GUI as much as possible and just migrate the code. Uh, and uh, inside the Onus project itself, uh, what we wanted to do is try and keep the old GUI in place while we build the new GUI, because it takes a certain amount of time to build it. We wanted to be able to run the two in parallel, so you'll see under web, there's a GUI and there's a GUI 2 project. And um, the GUI 2 project basically is built using um, Angular CLI, which is a command line tool for uh, managing Angular. And um, what we've done is a lot of integration between Book, the build system for Onus, and this Angular CLI tool. Uh, so, um, you know, the Book file basically is, uh, is, is uh, Calling all of these um, commands for uh, for calling Angular CLI. So, for instance, ng is the Angular CLI 
tool, here we're doing test, here we're doing build, and so on like this, and lint, and all of that level of integration is done. Um, so uh, what was involved in migrating? So basically, uh, the old GUI, if we just look at, uh, in particular, the uh, say the device view, um, you know, there was, uh, there was a JavaScript file there, and uh, it's, uh, I have it open here, basically what it is, is it's using Angular 1 type constructs in a JS file, so basically, uh, you know, you declared everything really was a function, uh, and it's complete functional programming. So here, for instance, this was a function that was called with the constructor to all of the methods, whereas the approach in Angular 6 is basically uh, everything is written in TypeScript as opposed to JavaScript, um, and then is compiled to JavaScript, and uh, it takes a much more object-oriented approach. So you can see that here we define a class, here we've got um, annotations, um, you know, here we're extending a class, and we're overriding methods here, for instance, like ng on init and destroy and, and all of this. So, as you can see, you know, there was a fair uh, amount of migration from the style of, of uh, AngularJS across to the style of Angular 6 and TypeScript and, and all of that. And the benefits of TypeScript are, are huge. And uh, basically, what it does is it allows you to, um, to write more robust code because uh, variables are strongly typed. And this is one of the big advantages uh, that I think that Angular 6 and TypeScript and everything like that brings. So um, quickly, I'll just uh, switch to the um, command line. I, I have a, I have a mini net there running to give me a network. Here I have Onus running and I'm going to, I just have run a feature install, GUI 2, and uh, now here I'm ready to log in at GUI 2. So the URL is UI2 and, uh, and, and the login is exactly the same and very little of the back end of uh, the Java side of Onus was changed to uh, make this work. So. Here we'll log in, and um, what we've completed at the moment is a table of views. So, for instance, uh, you know, we've got applications, um, and uh, it's, um, uh, it's not showing the, the icons for them at the moment. Uh, I, I'll have to investigate why that is. But basically, um, you know, it's got all of the functions and features that the old GUI had. For instance, you click on the application, and the um, the details panel flies in from the from the right hand side. You click on another one, it changes it. Uh, all of the buttons uh, here are working. You can stop and start the application. You, um, for instance, uh, you can we can stop it there. You're seeing the the text here in in French because I chose the French uh, uh, locale when I started Onus. I'm going to cancel that one and uh, close that window. And, and uh, all of the um, menus here uh, are using this uh, line function, as it's called. And uh, not all of the applications, for instance, the devices application, uh, isn't fully uh, uh, kitted out with the, the line uh, functionality. But you know, most of the framework features of Onus are uh, in place with it at the moment. Uh, this is a list of devices, and, and here you can see the, uh, the details view again. Uh, you can click on the uh, the ports, uh, you know, the uh, the flows, and and all of that kind of stuff as as you could before. Um, so here we've added the search field to the devices view, um, and you know we made some minor tweaks. So the, the big obvious thing that isn't here is the topology view, and uh, we wanted to tackle some of the tabular views before we need to jump into the, uh, the topology view, but that's uh, one of the big deliverables for uh, the Peacock release. Um, so there's, uh, I think, you know, other things we want to do in the Peacock re release is, uh, is um, build the thing with the Bazel build system, and, uh, and then also to tackle other uh, GUIs that can be loaded dynamically, like um, the Yang GUI and various other GUIs that people have built in applications external to the, the core 
owners uh, GUI applications. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's probably a, a lot of uh, what I had to say. Um, there, there is uh, a lot more documentation available. Um, if you go to uh, if you go to the code base you, uh, here, for instance, for the, the GUI two, you there's a README um, you know that explains a lot of, of uh, what I've shown how to start on us in a foreign locale and, and how to develop with us then using the Angular CLI. But the, the Angular CLI, I didn't, I didn't get into it, but a uh, very powerful tool. Uh, you know, when you go into the, the, the GUI 2 folder and run npm install, you, you'll be able to uh, access the, the Google DNG, um, uh, DNG tool from there. And uh, if you're in, if, you're in development. Uh, what this allows you to do is it basically allows you to uh, to, to serve up the the GUI and develop it. And as you make changes in the IDE, um, those changes are, are compiled immediately and reflected in a, a local version of the GUI that that you can run um, uh, out there and then even in parallel to the uh, to the GUI that's run inside of Onus. You know, so there's uh, it you know does all of these commands like uh, ng build um, for instance. Uh, there's also other tools for uh, CompoDoc. CompoDoc is a documentation tool that um, can work with Angular CLI and it produces uh, Java Java doc type documentation for all of the components that uh, that you have uh, in built in the Angular uh, framework. You know so so. Like the Angular framework, it has uh, a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of logical structure to it, you know. So, for instance, um, you know, uh, everything is a, everything is a component. Uh, there are components, devices, pipes, directives are the kind of primitives that uh, that Angular works off. But the, the component is is the the, the anchor uh, kind of thing, so it's like a, a library unit that you can reuse. So we build the Onus GUI as a component, but also we build the device details panel as a component. And you know, even as we build it, uh, you know, we're extending a base class that's common across all details panels. So you know, a lot of object-oriented approach going on there. Okay, so this was the, the set of links um, that uh, to the slides and to the, the readme that I showed. Uh, so thanks very much for watching, and um, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have another update at the end of the Peacock release. Well, this is this is great. Uh, I want to, even though Sean's not here, I would like to thank him for taking his time, especially in the evening, to put this together for us. So um, this is awesome. Uh, let's uh, return back to <laughs> okay, this is a short video. Sorry. So I think uh, this brings the presentation to a close. Uh, thanks again, everybody. Um, uh, I think this is the last release we're going to do the split planning session. I think from uh, for future releases we're going to do uh, just one session, probably smack in the middle of the Pacific time, which will be a little bit inconvenient for Europe, a little bit inconvenient for Asia, but at least we'll be able to have a consolidated one. Uh, because over time it is uh, uh, proven to be a little bit burdensome, uh, burdensome to do two of them. But anyway, thank you everybody for successful uh, our release. Uh, we're not out the door yet, but I think any day now, we're just waiting for final word from QA. So I expect that uh, in the next couple of days, probably the official release will be out, at which time we will um, close the Kanban boards that are um, currently open. We'll basically mark them as released, which means any items that have been closed as part of this release will be purged off and uh, basically will refresh the uh, the Kanban board ready to be going for the next release. Okay, so everybody who has a Kanban board can probably do that uh, on their own or ask me for help and I can help with that. Also, we will update the tutorial VMs, uh, the new release, and uh, we'll be ready to go full steam on the next one. So thanks, uh, thanks everybody again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.